In oceanographer believes the median wave height off of South Florida's coast is equal to 1.9 feet. Wave heights were measured for a random selection of 20 days. At the 5% significance level, use the sign test to determine if there is enough evidence to reject the claim. All right, so there's a couple of clues that this is a non-parametric procedure. The first one is that they're talking about the median wave height as opposed to the mean wave height. That's a good indication we're going to be dealing with a non-parametric procedure. Okay, if we know it's going to be non-parametric, what non-parametric procedure? Well, the sign test is clearly stated in the problem that we must use the sign test. Okay, so we know it's going to be the sign test. Let's get the claim for that then. The claim is going to be Eta, which is this uh, symbol here, and I haven't drawn it that well, but I'll, I'll draw it better when we do H-O and H-A. But Eta is like a kind of fancy shaped N. It's actually the Greek symbol for the letter Eta, and it represents our population median. And here we're saying the population median is equal to 1.9. Okay, so let's do H-O then and H-A. So H-O and H-A follow the same rules as before. If we have an equal sign in the claim, it makes the claim and H-O the same here. So we'll use eta, and that's a much better version of eta there. Eta is 1.9 here under HO, and HA, of course, which express the opposite idea. So if it's not equal to, it must be not equal to, right? 1.9. Okay. So there we have it. Now, for the data step, which we normally do in the problems, you know, for this problem, it's actually very simple. The only things we need to talk about is essentially N and alpha. N and alpha. So this is kind of all we have to do, and then we're going to uh, work with the data to get our test statistics. So let's get the n here. The n is basically the number of values we were given in the problem, the number of data values, or the sample size. However, we have to be very cautious and throw out any value that's equal to the number you see in HO. Why HO? Because HO is the thing we test in hypothesis testing, right? So we're going to be testing HO, assuming it's true initially, and then we're going to throw out any value that's equal to that specific number of 1.9. So let's do that then. Any number I see here that's equal to 1.9, I'll discard. That should be discarded because that's 1.9. But I don't see any other cases. So we're just going to throw out one of the 20 values, right? So I'll throw out one. It's going to give me 19. Alpha is 0 0.05 in the problem. All right, so that's all we do for the data step here. We don't have to do anything else. Our next step is to calculate the test statistic. To get the test statistic, we have to do a preliminary step, which is S smaller and S bigger. Now, this is only done for the two-tailed hypothesis testing procedure with the sign test. So when it says not equal to, whenever it says not equal to is when we use this procedure. So if you see not equal to, in the sign test, you have to use S smaller and S bigger to figure out what your test stat is. And our test stat will eventually be S, which is going to be the maximum between S smaller and S bigger. What do I mean by the maximum? I mean the one that's larger between these two. So both of these are going to be numbers because they're just counts, right? They're counts. How many values are smaller than this number? 1.9, right? How many values are bigger than 1.9? And then what we're going to have afterwards is the maximum between those two numbers. In other words, which one is the larger between those two? Okay, so let's count up how many values are smaller than 1.9. I see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. I count 11 numbers smaller. This must mean that S bigger is what? 11 from 19 gives you 8. We should see this to be 8. If it isn't 8, we made a mistake counting S smaller. You can also see why we had to throw out any value equal to 1.9, because obviously 1.9 would not be smaller or bigger, right? Okay, so let's count the number of values that are bigger than 1.9. We see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, Oops, I missed one. Let's check again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There is, in fact, eight. First time through, I might have miscounted or something or missed one, but it is eight exactly. Okay, good. So we've counted properly. We have 11, we have eight. Now we're going to take S equal to the max of those two numbers. In other words, the bigger of those two numbers. Well, since S smaller is 11 and S bigger is eight, the maximum then is going to be, of course, 11. So that becomes your test stat. 
The notation we use for the sign test is S. S is our test app for the sign test. Okay, now from here what we want to do is to go on to our next step, which is probably the most difficult step in this procedure for most people, and that is to calculate the p-value for the test. We don't use a rejection region, we use a p-value method instead. The p-value method for the two-tailed test is going to be two times the probability that x is greater than or equal to s, where x where x is a binomial random variable with n equals to, in this case, 19, right? And p equal to 0 0.50. Okay, so let's discuss that step just for a moment here. We assume that x is a binomial random variable because basically this procedure is being tested about the median. And what we're saying is that essentially the median has a 50, and any number from our data set, if the median really is 1.9, has a 50-50 chance of being what? Either above or below, right? So there's a 50% chance you're below the median, a 50% chance you're above the median because the median is defined as the 50th percentile, right? In other words, half the values must be below the median, half the values must be above the median. So if this really is the median, that means when I grab a sample of 20 values, I should expect typically about half of them to be below and about half of them to be above. Of course, that's in the perfect scenario where things always work out exactly as planned. Of course, in reality, we know there will be some variation. Things will always go exactly like that. So in a random sample of 19 values, I might get, for example, you know, 11 and 8, that sort of scenario. So what is this counting, this s smaller x bigger? It's basically counting how many values were below, how many values were above this median number. Of course, since it's not an even number of values, since we only have 19, the closest we could come is like a 10-9 scenario to being exactly 50-50. 11 8 is pretty close to that, so we might say, well, gee, that doesn't look too far away from this hypothesized median then, right? Because about half the values were smaller, about half the values were bigger. Of course, it wasn't exactly half, right? But, you know, 10 9 was the closest we could get to half, given that we have 19 values. All right, so what we're gonna do very simply is we're gonna say, look, since our S is this number here, we're saying, what's the probability that we're doing twice the probability that twice comes from the two-tailed? If it wasn't a two-tailed test, there would be no two there. But it's a two-tailed test because this is not equal to. So we're going to use two times the probability that x is greater than s, right? And this statement basically boils down to the probability that we would have this binomial random variable exceeding 11, which means essentially that we have 11 or more values that are smaller than 1.9, right? That's basically what we're coming up with, right? We're basically asking, geez, you know, is this an unusual thing to have if that really is 1.9? Is it unusual to have 11 or more values that are smaller than 1.9? That's basically what we're trying to calculate. If we found out that that was unusual, we would tend to think that the median isn't really 1.9. If we find out that this is a very typical thing to have when the median is 1.9, then hey, we won't worry about it. We'll say that, you know, the HO is fine. We should not reject it based on this data, right? Okay, so that's our idea behind the, the p-value. We're going to go to the table. We're going to look up um, basically the following situation. We're going to say, what's the probability that x is greater than 11, right? Since s is 11 here. Assuming that the x is a binomial random variable with n equal 19 and p equals 0.5. All right, now, before we can do that, I want to talk about this probability very quickly. Since it's 11 for our specific thing, s is 11, we're going to put 11 in there. We know our table won't give us that answer directly. If we go to our table, we can't make the table give us from 11 up like this is asking for, right? We can only make it go from, you know, the number that we have here, whatever we look up in the table, down. So if I look up, for example, 10 in the table, it gives me 10, 9, 8, 5, you know, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, all added together, all those probabilities added together. I want the probability that it's 11 or 12 or 13 or 14, all the way up to 19 added together. I don't want to go from 11 down, I want to go from 11 up. It doesn't do this calculation directly though, the table only goes from the number you give it down. So the trick to doing this, as we saw in one of the earlier videos, is actually to I'll put the two again here, right? But then the trick to doing this is to actually do one minus the probability that x is less than or equal to. So you switch to the greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, and then you take one number away from that number, making it 10 in this case. And if you do this, 
it will actually come out in the table. And then it means that we look up 10 on the table. So let's go look up, look up k equals to 10. If you have a table that uses c or something like that, then it's c equals to 10, n equals to 19, and p equals to 0 0.5. When we have that answer, we'll take that answer, do one minus that result, and then twice that, and that's finally our p-value. Okay, so let's go to the table now and look up those numbers. Okay, in this video I thought we would do something different. Rather than just go to the binomial table that you find in your typical textbooks, what I'd like us to do is to look at how to do it in a graphing calculator like this. So some of you may be using the graphing calculators or own them. I would just like to show you how to get the binomial cumulative probabilities from a calculator like this. So here's what you have to do. You have to press the second key, then you're going to press the bars key here, and when you're done, you're going to go down to where you see binomial CDF, CDF for the cumulative density function. So we're going down, you see it's this option A on my screen, right? Okay, so I'm going to hit enter now. And from there, I get this binomial CDF thing blinking at me. What it wants you to enter into the calculator is the N value that you're dealing with. So what was your N? What was your sample size? So in this case, our sample size was 19. So I type that in. Then you're going to enter a comma key. Now, the comma key on the calculator is actually just here above the 7 key. So it's right here, the comma key. You're going to hit that to put a comma after that, okay? So let's go back down and see that again. So there's our screen. We're going to hit this, the comma key. And then we're going to type in after um, n equals 19, we want to give it the probability. So we're going to give it 0.5, because remember, it's a 50% probability. We use 0.5 as our probability value. That's the probability of the success. And then we're going to do comma, and then we have to give it the k value. So in our case, the k value is 10 for this problem. So we'll hit 10, and close up the parenthesis, hit enter, and you'll get the answer 0 0.676. 0 0.676 when rounded to three decimal places. All right, so this is a nice alternative to the table, and of course, sometimes we don't have the table values available to us in certain tables, so um, it's easier to use the calculator in that instance, obviously. Okay, so we found our table value to be 0.676. So our expression here becomes 2 times 1 minus 0.676. All right, now from there, when you do the subtraction, right, 2 times 1 minus 0.676 becomes 2 times 0.324. All right, and then twice that, of course, is going to be 0 0.6. Four, eight. All right, so this is your p-value for the test. The p-value is almost 65%. Now, obviously, we have this rule that um, when the p-value is smaller than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. Obviously, 65% is not less than alpha. Alpha is 5%. So since p is greater than alpha, we do not reject HO, and therefore we do not support HA. All right, so that's our initial conclusion there. So again, whenever P is larger than alpha, we do not reject HO. In that case, we do not support HA. Now we look at our claim, and we see our claim is what? HO, right? So we're going to do our wording based on that. So what we would say is that the sample data does not allow us to reject the claim that the median is 1.9. All right, so that's basically the idea of the test. Now, one thing you might raise, you might say, hmm, well, you know, perhaps you feel like you should have been able to reject the null hypothesis. And if you did feel that way, you would maybe be able to argue, well, the sign test is a very weak test, and that means it has a hard time rejecting the null hypothesis. So it could be that maybe we should try a, you know, to you know, collect data and run a different test, a procedure that maybe is a little more powerful. So there are more powerful options in non-parametric procedures. There are also, of course, more powerful options in parametric procedures. But either way, um, you might say, well, we weren't able to reject HO. Perhaps that was due to the fact that the sign test is weak. So that's a valid argument here, because the sign test is a weak test, and that means it has a hard time rejecting HO, and maybe we weren't able to reject HO here strictly because the test is so weak. 
Um, I don't know that that's true here. Looking at the data, of course, it doesn't appear that this was too far off from being a 50-50 split between smaller and bigger, right? Considering that 10 and 9 is the closest we could get to, to a 50-50 split of the data. And if the median was 1.9, we'd expect to see about half being smaller than that number, about half being bigger than that number. So um, in this case, I don't know that we should have rejected HO, but um, certainly even if um, you know this was a little uh, more extreme, like maybe if it had been 12 and 7, we still might not have been able to reject HO, and that could be because the sign test is a relatively weak test. So anyways, so the point I'm mentioning here is just that when you're dealing with something like the sign test, which is a weak test, you want to make sure that um, you always consider that possibility that maybe you couldn't reject the HO because the sign test is so weak, and maybe that means you should be looking to uh, run a hypothesis test in the future for this type of data by using um, a more powerful test, a procedure that maybe is going to give you a little more ability to reject the null hypothesis when it is in fact false.